I'd like to welcome you to this Institute of Arctic Studies webinar. I am uh, Melody Birkins. I am the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies and the senior associate director in the, in, in the uh, John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. And we are so, so pleased today to have Dr. Daly Sambodoro here to speak with us on empowering Arctic indigenous peoples, our role in addressing climate change. The latest IPCC report, as many of you know, the International Panel on Climate Change report, it told us that we need global, coordinated, and immediate efforts to mitigate climate change if we are to keep temperatures from rising to catastrophic levels for our planet and our people. Arctic indigenous peoples have been stewards of these northern regions for tens of thousands of years. In this talk, Dr. Doro will discuss the global leadership roles, perspectives, and knowledge that Inuit and other Arctic indigenous peoples bring to climate change solutions and decision makings within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Paris Climate Agreement, and the International Panel on Climate Change. Dr. Doro, a very Wonderful, thank you, friend of Dartmouth for many years and the Institute of Arctic Studies has contributed her time to several discussions here and we couldn't be more honored to have her. She is the past international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, the ICC, serving from 2018 to 2022 and representing approximately 180,000 Inuit from Canada, Greenland, Russia, and the United States on the Arctic Council and diverse United Nations Fora. She is currently a senior scholar and advisor at the University of Alaska Anchorage, and she has also served as an expert member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. She is the former co-chair of the International Law Association Committee on the Implementation of the UN Declaration of the Rights on the Rights of the Indigenous Peoples, and was recently appointed to the expert panel on the future of Arctic and Northern research in Canada. She's also the co-chair of the Lancet Commission on Arctic Health and the recipient, uh, which is actually in partnership with uh, Dartmouth, um, uh, Dartmouth's Dr. Uh, Lisa Adams, and is the recipient of the 2022 International Arctic Science Committee's Medal for Outstanding Achievements in Advocacy for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Service to Arctic Communities, and influences, uh, influence as a legal scholar. So again, we couldn't be more honored and happy to have her here with us. Also her daughter, Hannah, thank you for being here. And uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you for being here daily. Good evening, not only to those in the room, but uh, also those who are joining us uh, live stream and uh, also to those who will watch in the future because I understand it'll get uh, posted on on um, a YouTube channel and be available um, as we go forward and uh, I greatly appreciate Melody the the introduction and also um, a bit of a preview as to what I hope to cover in in this uh, brief lecture and really the aim is to open up the indigenous world to you as um, uh, participants in this gathering this evening and to understand better how indigenous peoples are working to influence a significant international treaty. And I, I won't lie to you, one of the main challenges of course, is state governments and the state party members under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it's, it's kind of stunning to me as an, as an Inuk, as, a, as an indigenous person, uh, to watch governments undertake willingly obligations that they have a difficult time keeping. So um, I'll, I'll fly through this and look forward to uh, a few minutes of um, interactive uh, discussion. There are so many impacts upon our traditional homelands and our communities, our villages. Most of them are coastal villages, Inuit, rely upon the marine environment. 
and have done so for centuries. I'm not going to go through this detailed list, and this isn't even an exhaustive list. But those of you paying attention to the news know that dramatic weather changes have occurred and an increase in storm variability and severity of storms. These photos are from within the last 48 to 72 hours. Approximately 1,000 miles of coastline, most of them the coastline that our people live upon in Alaska, have been devastated by Typhoon Merbeck. Scientists have said out in the open Bering Sea that the waves reached at 50 feet. This is, this is significant. I borrowed this quote from a friend and colleague from my own home community in Ulicleet. And I didn't take the full text of the quote that he posted on Facebook, but I want you to know that this is real time. This is right now. Uh, the storm has impacted the toughest people on earth. You know when you open up Facebook and says, what's on your mind, Daily? As last night I was thinking, what's on my mind? I'm heartbroken and I'm angry about that lack of commitment that government show or industry or others show in relation to this kind of um, impact. So one of the important things about what Lee Ryan, an Anuk, um, again, someone that lives in the community at the village level, he notes, and, and it's not only his knowledge and wisdom, but he notes that of his parents and his grandparents that you know, yeah, we get large storms. This is something we're accustomed to. Inuit have adapted to, the, to one of the harshest environments on Earth. But these large storms usually come later in the year where there is ice pack, and that keeps some of the impact. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it cushions it to, to some extent. But this is, as he says here, an epic disaster. And he made the plea to leadership, um, Inuit, indigenous peoples, as well as state, federal, and other, uh, other leaders uh, to work together. And fortunately, many have responded to uh, the call that he made, as well as uh, other leaders have made. And these images, again, are uh, from his uh, collection of um, photos that he gathered for the Facebook post. And I'm sure that if you turn to the news, you're going to see and, and hear about this. So of course, we have all of these agencies uh, responding. And um, I think the important message here is ensuring, as, as Lee was uh, trying to point out in other elements of his Facebook post, that it's indigenous peoples that really need to be in the driver's seat in terms of the response by FEMA and other, uh, other agencies that are responding. But I'm grateful that they, they are responding. I understand that no one has lost their life um, because of this uh, impact. And this, I would, I would characterize as really the dregs of the typhoon, not the full impact of the typhoon, but um, what's on the horizon? When is the next storm going to hit? Lee Ryan also talked about, we got to get this straightened out before it freezes up, because winter is coming, and the freeze up will arrive very, very quickly. Um, this is significant. And we're also talking about areas where we've had a dramatic infrastructure gap for decades, a chronic infrastructure deficit. Uh, so not only uh, are we talking about impact to things like the fuel farm and, and other um, elements of infrastructure, those were already substandard. 
And we live in the United States of America, one of the most affluent countries on earth, and some of these communities that are suffering don't even have potable water, and they haven't had it for some time. So add this wave, right? I mean, think about, think about the level of uh, devastation that we're talking about. Never mind sanitation services, transportation, telecommunications, whatever it might be. So I would urge you to uh, inform yourselves about this and figure out ways, if you can, to assist uh, those that are in uh, urgent need. So climate change impacts, of course, means increased Arctic shipping. And um, most of you are probably familiar with the fact that those nations that uh, own huge fleets uh, and are in the shipping industry are already trying to identify uh, the most um, efficient routes, uh, fuel-wise and otherwise, um, to take commodities from one place to another or to take them out of the Arctic and bring them somewhere else. Uh, so obviously climate change has afforded uh, that industry and, and the nations that are major shipping nations um, an opportunity uh, to look at this as, a, as an alternative. Uh, they've done the, they've, they've crunched the numbers, you know? Uh, I mean, any good business person would do so. However, as far as um, the Arctic region, uh, in both the Northern Sea Route as well as the Northwest Passage, and again, I'm talking about our traditional territory across uh, the circumpolar Arctic, the impacts of Arctic shipping are quite significant. We've had some success in identifying ways in which to safeguard the marine mammals that we rely upon by working with, for example, the US Coast Guard, uh, to find safe shipping routes or corridors, but it's not sufficient. Um, never mind the fact that the International Maritime Organization uh, adopted a polar code. If you think about it, and you think about the thousand miles of coastline that have been impacted, who, who is going to really serve to be the eyes and ears to enforce something like the polar code? And then these, I'm just throwing out some questions for you to think about that, yes, we may have, we may have a regime and, and a, a, a plan and, and a possible um, way to respond, but who's actually going to do it? And I'll tell you right now uh, that in a majority of these communities, it will be Inuit. It will be us who go out and rescue uh, uh, those that have been endangered by a by a cruise ship accident. It will be, it will be our people who will, uh, in all likelihood, respond. Yet at the same time, all of these adverse impacts, they too compound uh, the already existing conditions. I wanted to point to um, some of the work that's done by at least the tribes throughout the United States. Uh, 227 of them, are the federally recognized tribes, are in Alaska. We comprise about 40% of the tribes across the United States, or 554 or so total in the U.S. So we have the lion's share of uh, tribes and tribal governments, including those in southeast Alaska and elsewhere. Uh, the work that was done in this particular report uh, is really important because it pulled together a number of recommendations from tribal governments to the federal government in order to respond to disasters like what I just uh, uh, showed you in terms of the photos in this, in this set of, of um, uh, slides. The one, probably at this time, if you think about it, the, the most important recommendation we made was for the federal government to provide one office, a one-stop shop to go to to address things like the disaster that's, that has occurred uh, in Alaska. It remains to be seen if these recommendations are going to be uh, taken seriously. 
Relocation, I will not be surprised if the list of uh, communities that were slated to uh, begin their, their uh, efforts at relocation, and I characterize it as forced relocation because they don't have a choice. Um, uh, I won't be surprised if by the time we hear the reports coming in from all of the communities that we that this list grows uh, even, even longer. And I could go off on a tangent about, well, why don't they move to somewhere else? Or I, 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 was, <laughs> I was stunned by some of the Facebook posts that were, were being made, but I, I better stay on point here. Um, one of the other areas, uh, in addition to national or domestic work uh, that we've been involved in, is of course the Arctic Council as a regional intergovernmental organization um, uh, comprised of presently only seven of the eight uh, Arctic states, so the five literal states minus uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, those familiar may know that they are uh, on pause uh, due to um, events in February. I'll just say that broadly. Um, but our people and the Inuit Circumpolar Council in particular was very active in um, the four working groups that are noted here. There are six total. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the uh, emergency uh, prevention and preparedness uh, working group in light of the uh, disaster in Alaska. But these. These four working groups were uh, those that we paid particular attention to for various different reasons. And of course, PAIM, or the protection of the Arctic marine environment, is at the, at the top of the list. I want to underscore the fact that all of these issues are interrelated. If you interrelated, interconnected, and indivisible from our point of view, if you alter one element in the ecosystem, for example, all other elements are going to be uh, impacted. Um, if we had more people and more resources to engage in the other two working groups, we probably would. But uh, for the time being, um, the Inuit Circumpolar Council is active in, in these particular working groups. Um, our international engagement also includes, as I mentioned, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, the IPCC, I've also referenced the International Maritime Organization. By the way, I should point out that the Inuit Circumpolar Council is the first indigenous people's organization to gain observer status within the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, to influence uh, the IPCC and to introduce indigenous knowledge to introduce our own observations, our own monitoring activities um, so that scientists are better informed about what is actually happening in relation to climate change. We're also the only indigenous people's organization that's a member of the International Maritime Organization. They came back to us when we applied and said, well, um, can't you just join the government uh, delegation? Or can't you join a non-governmental organization? It's like, nope. Consistent with the right of self-determination, we are going to speak for ourselves, and we're not going to rely upon, upon any other. So uh, we're fortunate to have, at the time, uh, right now, uh, provisional uh, status, which means that they'll come back to see in two years whether or not we've kind of lived up to uh, the claims that we've made in our, in our application. Uh, the IUCN, the uh, Convention on uh, the International Trade of Endangered Species, and many, many others. We're also the only indigenous uh, peoples that are presently monitoring what is happening with, with the latest Arctic Treaty, the International Agreement to Prevent Unregulated High Seas Fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean, this donut hole, the, the, the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries uh, <laughs> Agreement, um, which invokes indigenous knowledge, and also uh, within the agreement, and I think it may be the only international treaty that explicitly references the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, another initiative that we were directly involved. The point being, 
in terms of all of this activity is to emphasize that we hold distinct knowledge, unique knowledge, as well as a holistic understanding of the Arctic and bringing these perspectives, this different worldview, this different cultural context, as well as our profound relationship to the environment that we've adapted to over hundreds of years is, is a crucial element of, of all of this work. And of course, it, it requires recognition that we have a distinct status, a distinct set of rights that attach to us as indigenous peoples. I guess I shouldn't say a distinct set of rights because they're actually the same rights that every one of us enjoys. It's just the cultural context that we uh, bring to this picture that is very, very important. But self-determination is at the core of it. We've worked for effective engagement of our leaders and our communities based upon the knowledge that we can bring to every discussion every discussion and it's you know oftentimes you will go to a meeting and and indigenous peoples are are siloed or segregated and like oh yeah that activity is over there well all of all of the issues including geostrategic and geopolitical security and defense issues are relevant to us right as human beings as collectivities that occupy a unique area of the world one of the other um, elements that we've been involved in is helping others, and scientists in particular, understand that we're willing to co-produce knowledge with them. Um, that, I mean, here you are at Dartmouth, right? It's an academy for the production of knowledge. And uh, if we think about the production of knowledge, uh, and the opportunities that exist for the co-production of knowledge, it's really significant. And in fact, that's really been at the heart of the meetings of our uh, uh, today, uh, the discussion about um, indigenous knowledge and research and science and how to, how to co-produce. Likewise, it's at the heart of the Lancet Commission work that Dr. Adams and I are involved in as well. Uh, again, the these discussions are interrelated. You know, I talk about the IMO, I can talk about the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and its relevant provisions, which are quite extensive. They go far beyond just real estate. <laughs> you know, governments, including the US, are very focused on just real estate when it comes to uh, territory. But there are so many other provisions and, and chapters of UNCLOS. Uh, I've already mentioned the Central Arctic Ocean. The biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, if you, if we, and we learn this all right in middle school science class, that ecosystems, everything, everything is related to everything else. That um, uh, if, and if you don't take this approach, then there's ample room for damage. Um, I just quickly want to say that the next item, the Pikiela Sosuak Implementation Committee, is um, in relation to marine protected areas. So if you're a people, you're reliant upon the marine environment and the desire to have what has been referred to by those in Canada, a mosaic of marine protected areas across uh, the traditional um, coastal areas of Inuit uh, that affords the opportunity for um, hunters, fishers, and other harvesters uh, that have relied upon uh, these areas, uh, again, for generations um, to interact consistent with their values and, their, again, that profound relationship that they have to the environment. A marine protected area takes on a different definition uh, because of that cultural context. So this. The PIC is an effort to uh, specifically um, assert Inuit management and control of one of the most biologically rich 
north water polynias in the world between Canada and Greenland. And uh, we've been very successful in some dialogues at the international level. Um, it helps that Canada and Greenland, or Denmark, I should say, uh, recently resolved the Hans Island issue. <laughs> oh, that little, yeah, yeah, you can, I, the, the body language, you, you clearly understand. It's like, so one of the elements of that agreement was the travel uh, across the international border by Inuit, and this has been an objective since our inception in 1977 at the organizing conference uh, in Ukiavik, Alaska. Um, I, I also want to just come back and highlight the, the work we've done in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and specifically uh, the special report on oceans and the cryosphere. Uh, we use this as an opportunity to pry the door open and uh, influence the discussion on the cryosphere uh, by indicating that our knowledge about ice and sea ice uh, in particular is relevant to the work of the of really everyone and not just the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, turning to what is happening within the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, indigenous peoples uh, the world over were involved very minimally in the 1992 UN Conference on Environment and Development. Or, referred to as the Earth Summit. And of course, this international gathering spawned a range of different international instruments, including the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The objective in 1992, what is it, 2022? OK, how are we doing on uh, stabilizing greenhouse gases? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Then the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. Here again, we were directly involved in trying to influence the Kyoto Protocol um, by revealing how climate change is impacting our communities. And again, trying to influence the discussion uh, in the way of how science is done and the, and the need for indigenous knowledge. Finally, in 2015, uh, the Paris Agreement adopted by consensus includes reference to the rights of indigenous peoples. So not only Inuit and Arctic indigenous peoples, but indigenous peoples around the globe. Um, in 2018, there was a pretty significant announcement of, about um, quite a lot of funding to uh, respond to climate change over the next five years. I'm not gonna get into this too too heavily because of time, but also it's it's, the UNFCCC is a huge bureaucracy, right? <laughs> I, I can't say it in any other way, right? The United Nations itself I mean, this is what the largest bureaucracy on earth. And then you have all the related activities and, and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and, and especially since 1992, has become uh, another, as I said earlier in our meeting, behemoth as far as um, bureaucracy is concerned. But there are subsidiary bodies as well as constituted bodies. And um, recently, uh, indigenous peoples and their participation in the UNFCCC galvanized their forces across uh, the globe to inform all the state parties that attend the Conference of the Parties at the UNFCCC. Um, we've been involved um, consistently uh, because even as far back as 1992, we were seeing the impacts of climate change and trying to ring the bell loud enough for others to hear that it's quite significant. Um, in 2000, uh, Indigenous peoples became a formal constituency, um, meaning that um, party members, state party members, um, we have access to certain uh, venues within uh, the treaty itself uh, and all of its various different bodies. 
The International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change was created in 2008 um, to really be the Indigenous Caucus and to, to coordinate and strategize how uh, we can influence the various different COPs that take place and what the priorities happen to be to identify individuals to help negotiate on our behalf and so forth. Um, it is significant that if you now go back to uh, the UNFCCC's website, you will identify at least, and there are more now since this um, uh, PowerPoint was generated, 60 decisions that refer to indigenous peoples and also indigenous knowledge. Just some photos of indigenous peoples participating um, at the UNFCCC. I'd like to point out in the upper, uh, upper left, Sheila Watt-Cloutier, the author of the book, The Right to be Cold. Um, and we're fortunate to have her as one of the commissioners on our, our Lancet Commission uh, project. Uh, she was then the uh, international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council and took a human rights action linking the impacts of climate change and U.S. government inaction uh, to impacts that Inuit were suffering. And though the Organization of American States and the Inter-American Human Rights Commission uh, didn't fully um, or definitively determine um, any uh, violations, it at least brought attention to the issue and put the face of Inuit and the Arctic onto the climate change stage. And I think that was significant in and of itself. I'm very pleased with the photo in the center because we are consistently uh, engaging our young people. Uh, they, um, they were amazing at COP25. Uh, they, all these young people shown in that picture, and I'm certainly not one of them, is uh, uh, the film crew for uh, a short film uh, from Tuktoyaktuk entitled Happening to Us. And they very carefully um, interviewed people in the community about what they see as, as changes that they've uh, felt and seen in, in their lifetime. Um, so indigenous peoples within uh, the UNFCCC, the main messages are, are bolded here. Of course, it's recognition of indigenous peoples and our knowledge systems uh, specifically. Also, they referred to sciences and innovations. Uh, the effort and objective of our full and effective and meaningful participation at every level, as well as concrete action. And I think that this aligns with what many have said about the need for concrete action, as well as the protection of the rights of indigenous peoples in the context of, of climate change. So at various different COP meetings, um, there's been an incremental um, uh, space um, carved out um, throughout uh, the various different COP sessions. And I would, I, I would have to say I made mention of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples earlier. That international human rights instrument took 25 years to negotiate and finalize before it gained adoption by the UN General Assembly in 2007. So we're patient. Right? Uh, but it's, it's becoming harder and harder in the face of, of the kinds of um, epic disasters that, that are taking place. Um, but the good news here is that uh, at COP24, um, there was an agreement and discussion about creating a constituted body. Um, earlier in the structure, the uh, organizational structure cite the idea of creating a specific body uh, that would be inclusive of indigenous peoples. Um, it was agreed that this take place, so a new facilitative working group comprised of indigenous peoples and state party members was put in place. Uh, I was fortunate to serve as the Arctic region 
uh, representative for the last three years um, in, in this facilitative working group. And uh, state party members and indigenous people sit in, in equity. Uh, they're equal, equal um, members and uh, decision making by consensus. One significant thing about this, unlike all other UN bodies, indigenous peoples are able to identify and elect their representatives themselves, not with the oversight or approval of governments. Uh, and these other institutions, like the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, the final say is by states. Um, so you, you can see that, OK, we, we took another huge step forward, is that we don't have that kind of oversight. Um, and so that, in, in and of itself, is quite significant. The government of Canada uh, and the Trudeau administration um, has provided funding um, for an indigenous focal point. Uh, there are still some things to uh, negotiate there as far as the facilitative working group is concerned. Um, I won't get into too much of the, of the detail here, um, but it's important that um, there is respect for the rights of indigenous peoples, the, their status, their legal status, but also the political role, and importantly, what we bring in terms of knowledge. And um, one of the ways that this uh, facilitative working group has been effective is through various different work plans that are, that are generated between both indigenous peoples and state party members in order to be effective as to the mandate of the facilitative working group. And uh, the mandate includes um, knowledge and knowledge production, also policy and how to advance uh, policy and capacity, increasing capacity. So those are really the, the three large mandates of uh, the facilitative working group, and I'll get to that in a second. So as far as the Arctic region is concerned, um, when I made mention that I served as the Arctic region representative to this new facilitative working group, uh, we have had a very unique and good collaborative collegial working relationship with other Arctic indigenous peoples, and namely and specifically the Sami people of northern Norway, Sweden, Finland, and, and uh, this Murmansk region of the Russian Federation. So if you think about the Inuit Circumpolar Council going from Chikaka, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, and Norway, Sweden, and Finland, um, it's a, a pretty significant area. Uh, unfortunately, the Russian Federation, because of its size and dominance, um, has a region um, uh, outside of this. But I think we need to consider in the future creative ways to be responsive to this dynamic because there are a significant number of Arctic indigenous peoples in the Russian Federation, um, uh, including our friend and colleague Tatiana Degai, who's seated here uh, with us. So who knows about the future and reform of these different um, institutions that are that are state created, but I just included um, the fact that we certainly at present the Inuit Circumpolar Council and the Sami Council we have a good relationship to to rotate um, our representation and keep each other informed on behalf of the Arctic region. But we've underscored that climate change we face very unique impacts. And uh, because of this, and the reality that the Arctic is warming at four times faster rate than other parts of the world, that uh, we should safeguard our distinct voice and really uh, bring it forward through our collaboration and our communication. I, I want to just quickly say about the the first facilitative working group uh, uh, work plan. Uh, the Arctic region um, heavily influenced the development of the, of the two-year work plan, which is now done. They're now uh, uh, focused on uh, the next three-year work plan. But I wanted to point out that 
one of the key things that we did was bring forward the importance of indigenous knowledge. And I mentioned that capacity building uh, was one mandate of the facilitative working group. And here we turned the whole uh, table around and told state party members that in terms of indigenous knowledge, we are the experts and you guys need to raise your capacity to understand uh, the contours and the elements of indigenous knowledge and how to engage indigenous knowledge holders in an ethical and equitable fashion. Um, we also uh, led an activity that focused on uh, indigenous knowledge in education and development of curriculum. We also um, really influenced the web portal that now exists for indigenous peoples through the facilitative working group. So you can visit the UNFCCC website and visit, visit um, uh, the FWG. Um, also, uh, of course, the big, as I've said over and over again already in this lecture, the indigenous knowledge uh, banner uh, has been significant. But other elements like um, assessment and evaluation, which is another dynamic that we talked about in our meetings, is that, yes, we can do these things, but what about assessment? What about evaluation? And uh, one of the key um, elements that we in, engaged in most recently within the UNFCCC was a careful technical assessment from an indigenous perspective of the global stock take within the UNFCCC. Um, we influenced this, uh, the current three-year work plan, which is now underway. We put youth at the top, uh, that you, you have to engage young people, young indigenous peoples. Uh, we also need the resources to enhance our participation. Again, continuing the training uh, workshops and orientation sessions, because when you, who in the room's been to a COP of the UNFCCC? Raise your hand. It's a dizzying experience. I mean, there are thousands of people. And of course, it makes you pause and think, oh, how much fuel was burned just to get all these cats here, right? I mean, it, 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 and, and in fact, with, uh, with COVID, we, we thought the numbers would go down at, at Glasgow. We thought, oh, but guess what? It was the largest cop ever. I mean, anyway, we could, we could get into a big fun fest over some of, the, some of these numbers, but, um, but the idea of going to one of these sessions and you've got the state party members, their, their space, you've got NGOs, you've got the indigenous peoples, you've got, I mean, and then the pavilion where everybody's kind of, it's like selling their wares, so to speak. Um, including the cryosphere pavilion, which we were, as Inuit, we were happy to, to occupy and use as our, our space to do a, a, a range of different site events. Um, but orientation, so that when you walk in and, and there are 30,000 people around you all at this conference of the parties, you, you'll know where to go and what, what, what to focus on. Um, but also, the, the need for real technical, critical analysis of what state party members are actually doing. Um, this was a, a, an important feature because, honestly, all of us have to be watchdogs, and indigenous peoples, I think, have to be uh, super keen and surgical watchdogs when it comes to, when it comes to this. So in terms of intersections, because of the desire to ensure that there is a holistic approach and that, that these entities are, are related. Um, if you think about the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and then the regional organization of the Arctic Council, what are the intersections? How do these, how do these two either assist each other or what are the opportunities for collaboration? Um, I've tried to open up that space too, that if, if the protection of the Arctic Marine Environment Working Group and the Arctic Council is doing something significant and helpful 
to indigenous peoples at the UNFCCC? How do we, how do we make these connections? Where do we find the intersections? Um, and this is an area that I think is, is really important uh, that I, I don't, I, I haven't really um, uh, found a way to nurture this idea or if it's even, if it's even uh, worth doing, but I, I think it's an important thing to do because we don't need to be recreating the wheel every time we uh, make a move. I just wanted to show um, uh, people that some of the observations that I've had in, in, uh, throughout this work that it is time consuming. It takes a lot in the way of uh, individuals and resources. I've already talked about watchdogging, what happens, because there's a lot that happens. Um, Every, every document that emerges and, and who's, going to, who's going to lend their critical eye uh, as well as a legal analysis to, to, to some of these uh, materials that uh, arise. Um, I don't want to get off on a discussion about this term local communities except to say that earlier I referenced the 25-year effort, it was actually more than that, but the 25-year effort within the United Nations to achieve the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples it makes very clear, and it's very comprehensive in terms of the rights of Indigenous Peoples. We have governments working to superimpose the term local communities because they challenge our collective rights, our status, and our role within domestically. We, we probably all have stories about that. Um, at the moment, the worst is um, Indonesia. Uh, it's like, oh, no, no, we don't have indigenous peoples. We're, it's like, oh, what's on their economic agenda, right? We, you know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear. Um, the other element is that, you know, all of this work, and, and we even get the criticism from some in our own communities, that why, why are you doing this? Why is this important to do? Well, in my estimation, every effort at the local, national, and international level is every, every possible avenue that you can take, you should take it, and it, it, as long as it's, it's it's clear, it's strategic, and, um, and productive. Um, safeguarding the diversity of indigenous peoples. It, one, one common reaction from states is that, well, why can't you just send one representative? You know, if there are 476 million of you, and there's this extraordinary diversity, Sending one indigenous person isn't going to work. That, that, that doesn't work, right? Um, so safeguarding that diversity and ensuring that that diversity is represented. Uh, for example, in a statement on oceans, you know, um, asking indigenous people to contribute to a discussion about oceans and coastal seas you know, Australian Aboriginal people in seagrass is very much different to what you're going to find off the coast of Utkiavik, for example, our northernmost community. Um, funding, we have this, and this is, this is amplified in the UN FCCC, and, and equity of funding, because we have all these schemes that were built up, right? Uh, uh, throughout the history of, of climate change, the developed world and the developing world, right? And there's this, uh, okay, I'll just be nice and say it's frustrating. It's really frustrating to see the level of um, inequity that emerges out of this false dichotomy of the developed world and the developing world. The images I showed you earlier and the comments I made about the chronic infrastructure deficit, again, in, in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, um, you, you can't tell me that there's a real distinction when it comes down to 
nuts and bolts and pennies and nickels. You know. Um, anyway, I think I think everyone everyone gets that. The um, the other issue, of course, is just uh, monitoring what others are doing. And I made this comment in our meeting about how we're overwhelmed by non-governmental organizations, uh, many of whom want to pick up the agenda because they can attract money. Um, and being able to safeguard our space and utilize our voices uh, consistent with our right of self-determination and the maintenance of our distinct status, rights, and role within the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, as well as multiple and diverse uh, UN and other intergovernmental organizations is, is significant. So I think we've, in my assessment, we've made uh, some, some headway within this international legally binding treaty, um, but there's still much to do. And as far as the title is concerned, I think that indigenous peoples, we ourselves, uh, consistent with the right of self-determination, we are empowering ourselves, uh, but there are also ways in which others can, can work um, to support us and become our allies uh, at really any fora, including uh, uh, within the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So I um, didn't have time to do a, a quick survey of the sites that you could go to if you're able or willing to make a contribution to help people um, uh, in Alaska, this current context, or indigenous peoples generally. Um, I know that they exist out there. Uh, I did see some important ones announced on Facebook, so I just encourage you to, to have a look around if you, if you are able. But Hianak, thank you for your, your interest in this uh, lecture and your attention, and I hope we have a uh, time for a um, short discussion. I wasn't monitoring time, so I, I hope I'm not abusing my time. Yeah. Not at all, thank you. No, 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 thank you so much. Uh, we will have some questions online, but I'd love to look at the room first and see if anyone has any questions. We will bring you, we'll bring you a, a, oh, it's coming to you, so you can speak into the microphone for the folks online. <clears throat> I just wondered, um, and thank you very much for coming and sharing all these wonderful thoughts with us and uh, alerting us to, to many of these issues. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, I was wondering if you could um, perhaps describe a little bit more about the platform for spiritual um, issues. Um, are there certain issues that are classified as spiritual and addressed as such? It seemed that that was the case. And maybe you could just uh, explain a little bit more about that area. Thank yeah, you. If we, thank you for the question. If we, if we think about this in terms of uh, indigenous knowledge, for example, and I think that might be what, kind of what you're getting at. I talked about the profound relationship that, that Inuit and other indigenous peoples have to the natural world, to their environment, much of which is spiritual, um, uh, in, in nature, if we think about it, um, and more importantly against the backdrop of the right of self-determination and what people choose collectively um, to, to share or choose not to share, uh, just when you start to bump into um, those issues, um, that is suggested in your question in terms of um, spirituality, ceremony, uh, important and unspoken protocols in communities. You know, it's, uh, it, it really is, and, and in fact, it's probably one of the key elements where safeguards are necessary. So for example, I pointed out that we influence the web portal at, uh, within the UNFCCC, and if you go to their website and, and try to access the web portal, for example, governments thought, well, we could just dump indigenous knowledge in this web portal. No, 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 you don't, you don't do that, right? There, there are certain things that, that 
as indigenous peoples, as communities, as collectivities um, that need to be safeguarded and, and carefully treated. Um, hence our desire to, to consider what are the elements for ethical treatment equitable treatment, uh, especially when it comes to, to things that are, uh, in, in many cases, unspoken or only spoken of uh, within community. Um, I think that was the nature of your question. Thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Other questions in the room? I was like the Oprah mic thing. Yeah. Daily. Mm. I actually had a question about um, what us non-Indigenous science can, scientists can do better, not do, but do better for and with our um, Indigenous colleagues, co-producers of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then a second question was just about the FWG work plan. You had mentioned uh, training workshops and orientation sessions. I just was wondering if you give a concrete example of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that um, one of the first places to start is um, as a as a scientist um, or group of scientists, uh, colleagues, is to really understand. Um, what we mean when we say indigenous knowledge. And we're fortunate, certainly through the ICC, to have uh, prepared a definition. Uh, there, there are other definitions, uh, including um, one being discussed uh, within, at least on the indigenous side of the table, within the facilitative working group. Uh, so really understanding uh, what we mean when we uh, use that term. If we had time, I'd give you another lecture and another PowerPoint that would illustrate the definition. Um, but um, the other important dynamic, uh, and I shared this in, in our meeting, that they that there is a substantive element, and I just referred to it in answer to the first question about spirituality, the substantive element of self-determination and deciding deciding um, even what to call it, because there, there's not even uniformity or agreement amongst indigenous peoples about the term indigenous knowledge. There are those who refer to traditional knowledge, uh, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, uh, wisdom, I mean, the whole host of things. But getting to the procedural aspects of it, uh, there are some important resources that exist that point to um, the expectations or the expected behavior of, of scientists wanting to engage uh, indigenous knowledge holders and even uh, more specifically to co-produce knowledge with scientists. Um, and the procedural steps, uh, and in fact, we invoke these in the meeting that we had today, of that we have to, one of the first steps is to invite indigenous peoples to join the conversation so that they are collaborating, they are co-creating, they are co-producing um, the strategy. Uh, including, well, is this piece of research even relevant? Is this a priority? How will it impact the community? Uh, you know, all of the, all of the questions that, that one would think, anyway, that a scientist would take into account when preparing a proposal, right? How do we, uh, and it, it really, I think it boils down to um, the, the behavior and ensuring that co-production, uh, and it so, sounds so funny that they're pretty basic definitions, right, of, of, of equality or equity uh, in, in that relationship. Um, 
and I mean, husband and wives must do this, partners must do this, right? You know, they're pretty, they're pretty common sense, but there are numerous resources out there that identify it more specifically within the indigenous context of, um, you know, when you enter a community. Uh, and in fact, I've, uh, I made mention to somebody earlier in the meeting, uh, for example, the Inuvialui settlement region, um, you know, they, you know, they, their territory, and it's in the context of a, a modern day treaty protected by the Constitution of Canada, as soon as you arrive in their territory, you, you better step in and meet with the leadership and essentially ask permission to be there and what are you, what are you gonna do? But they've become so sophisticated that they, they even um, uh, ensure that matters like compensation to indigenous knowledge holders you know, you as, a, you as a scientist may have attracted, you know, a $6 million National Science Foundation grant. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, but yeah, you're going to come here and, uh, I don't know, study in the invasion of beavers and what do you do about them? It, uh, and ensuring that the knowledge holders that you engage with are compensated, but also treated with basic respect as, as um, individuals that have uh, unique or distinct knowledge um, that will become a part, perhaps, of uh, what you're researching. Too often, and this is, includes uh, the Inuvialui settlement region, but too often in, in our communities, uh, we have seen scientists come and go, never knowing what they're actually doing. Um, and you're, you're nodding your head, and I know you're, you're, you're familiar with some of these elements, but protocols and basic guidelines. One of the recent projects of the Inuit Circumpolar Council was uh, uh, on the topic exactly of equitable and ethical protocols, ethical and equitable engagement, so that guidelines are, are there and um, what is expected, expected behavior. Um, and yeah, I could, I could open them up and be even more detailed, but I think that um, it, broadly speaking, um, at least that resource, and there, there are many, many other resources that are available uh, that are being developed by indigenous peoples uh, across the world. The second part of your question on um, uh, training workshops of the facilitative working group, uh, so activity four in particular um, was, COVID hit, we, we wanted them to all be in person. We ended up having to do them uh, online. Uh, so they ended up being Zoom webinars where we had indigenous uh, peoples from seven regions of the world, so globally, uh, who were indigenous knowledge holders or were academics working in the area of indigenous knowledge uh, to uh, provide a training, uh, to provide presentations about indigenous knowledge and the use of indigenous knowledge and what some of the, some of the basic and fundamental criteria are for um, safeguarding indigenous knowledge, but also, more importantly, I think the, the elements necessary for genuine co-production of knowledge with, with scientists. And I think the, the overarching um, target was, um, for example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. How do we interact with scientists um, that offer their materials to the IPCC? Uh, how, do we, how do we engage with them uh, specifically, and the, the element um, of s uh, several of those webinars also uh, touched upon the advances that have been made in countries around the world where indigenous knowledge is, is understood, that's well-defined and safeguarded, uh, but also has corresponding um, legal responsibilities uh, that then venture into uh, the funding agencies, they, uh, uh, their equivalent of institutional review boards and so forth. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I saw one more question in the audience, or was, is it okay? 
I was going to then move to on the web, but if I, I saw one more here, no? Oh, yes, Jamie, good. So I found the point that you made about member states needing to do their own capacity building in terms of understanding and respecting indigenous knowledge really interesting. And I think I'm curious about what has the reception to those discussions been and maybe what are some of the challenges um, for communicating the importance of capacity building within you know places we refer to as developed nations. Um, mm -hmm. What has the response been like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, being context specific is a little bit hard, but generally, um, generally speaking, uh, this is an area where, um, and again, at the long view, that the important mileposts have been achieved, right? The, I mean, if you if you even think about um, my reference to the to the status, rights, and role of indigenous peoples, this is uh, it's more commonplace uh, in you know it's probably not spoken of in every American household, but it's more commonplace. Um, and so I I think that taking that long view, some important some important mile posts have been reached. And because of that, we now have an opportunity to really build on the, the foundation uh, that was created by things like the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Or, and, and it occurred to me when I was first appointed to the facilitative working group, is that I kind of looked around at the young people and I said, gosh, all of you as young people don't have to convince the rest of the world that climate change is real. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, okay. So, you know, as far as a, a mile post. Uh, so I think that the, this um, advocacy for the, the uh, recognition of and the respect for indigenous knowledge and its relevance to to science, its relevance, more importantly, to policy and decision makers, is gaining ground. And um, you know, there there are some important examples where uh, progress has been made. And I think that um, you know what, I'm an optimist. I I really am. I sometimes I get you know angry and pretty pissed off about things, but. I'm optimistic, and I think that the, in terms of moving forward, that we're we're providing a, an important foundation that is missing in other in other contexts. And I think that, um, and I'm seeing it myself, especially when um, we see images like those that I shared. That 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 people people now recognize that. Indigenous peoples have a, a distinct understanding about the environment that they live in, and as a matter of, um, I mean, and morally and and politically and legally, um, you know, greater acceptance. And I'm I'm hopeful about about the change, but it the challenges are they're as as persistent as. I know. I, if we got into specifics, we we might need to meet outside in the hall, and and I could tell you about some nasty negotiations. But but um, I, I think overall, um, the empowerment of indigenous peoples and the fact that they have raised their voices and and um, targeted uh, important areas is, is significant. I will say in those observations at the end that there, there are now so many areas that are opening up uh, for indigenous peoples and we just don't have the, we don't have enough people to, to, to really engage and, and to participate. That's a huge challenge uh, in and of itself, you know. So every new, every new, um, uh, observer status that we gain, who's going to go, 
right? Who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna be there? You know, and 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 how are they going to to deal with it? Um, so, yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Well, and that segued actually beautifully. That we should, we'll continue talking about this too, hopefully later. But um, there are two questions here that both come from youth who I think have either met you, I'll show you them later, but just in general, two young folks basically saying we are, we are Inuk and we would like to be more uh, involved. How can they already, how can we do this? We hear you, we want to be there. What, what can we look for? What can we do? Um, we hear the call, but what's our next step? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think that, um, I, I first want to go back to to something that um, uh, Valerie Davidson, a, a Lancet Project Commissioner, um, said here at Dartmouth in response to a question by um, uh, two young women who were studying here. Um, Pursue what you're passionate about. Sounds too simple, right? But in our context, whatever it is that you're doing, we need you. Whatever it is you're doing, we need you. You can want to be an accountant. Yeah, we need those accountants. You want to be a lawyer. You want to be a doctor. You want to be an airline pilot. You want to be a, a geologist. You want to be a midwife. You want, whatever it is, So as long as you're passionate about it. Because as I was saying earlier, everything's interrelated. And all these issues, the economic, social, cultural, spiritual issues, are all relevant. Um, in terms of the issues concerning this subject matter and climate change, uh, I think there are a host of different opportunities um, for the, the two students or young people that are Inuk, I think, Outreach and contact with the Inuit Circumpolar Council uh, in Alaska, uh, in Anchorage, Alaska, in Ottawa, Canada, in New Greenland, uh, in Anadir, Chikatka. Make that contact and uh, say that you're willing to offer your intellect to this field of work. Um, and also, I wouldn't hesitate to start conjuring up ideas about how you can get yourself to a COP meeting, right? And how you can make sure that your, your face and your voice are, 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 are present and heard. Um, I think there, I have, all, I have a lot of other ideas about um, how this could be furthered. You know, that effort by those uh, four youth from Tuktoyaktuk, that was significant. And you know, I I don't I don't know how to do this, but I know that people can make films with their iPhones, right? You know, I mean, the apparent, apparently, um, but the, I think there are all kinds of things that that can be done. Yeah, mm -hmm. I hope that answers the questions. Or question. And I I will. You have done. You've done a whole day with us. Thank you. Oh, two days with us. You have uh, done a wonderful Q&A with the audience. You have done an incredible talk. So thank you again for being here. Um, and thank you, everyone online, for all of your attention. We had a, a, quite, a, quite a group out there. And uh, I just I hope we can continue to have you with us and your knowledge with us mm -hmm. and uh, moving forward on all of these issues, from climate change to human rights and uh, the most important, the, the self-determination of all peoples. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kiana, thank you. Thank you.